2002, where the overarching objectives of and essential requirements for sustainable development were highlighted. We have eight goals, eradicate extreme hunger and poverty, achieve universal primary education, promote gender <coughs> equality, and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve mat maternal health, combat all diseases, especially those which are very uh, serious, ensure environmental sustainability, develop a global partnership for development. New approaches continue to offer a better understanding of sustainable development as the growing role of scientific knowledge and technologies which have articulated indicators such as planetary boundaries, the ecological footprint, and other measures of human impact on the planet. The Rio to Earth Summit in 2012 addressed issues of sustainable development goals that were proposed by Colombia, Guatemala, and Peru. Its aim is to remind policymakers and other stakeholders of the importance of reaching a solid outcome by integrating these goals into a single unified process, as this would set out a clear post-2015 framework. Despite the progress, however, a gap still exists between past words and actual deeds. Why is this so? The chief reasons are a lack at all levels of prioritizing sustainable development, limited access to financial resources, weak commercial viability of the required investments, inadequate and inappropriate human, financial, technical, and institutional capacity dedicated to implementation and evaluation, Limited public awareness, which is very important. When we have public awareness, it's helped a lot. And the lack of changes in lifestyle. It's also due to lack of dissemination and the, an absence of shared epistemological paradigm. When in a project, uh, people are working together, even in transdisciplinary uh, research, sometimes uh, they cannot communicate well, and this is a lack of dissemination. The world is facing broader and ever more urgent issues, which may both jeopardize the option available for meeting the basic human needs and eradicating poverty and threatened efforts to achieve sustainable development. At the operational level, it has become clear that a new goal of sustainable development other than gross domestic product and improved institutional governments are necessary to effectively monitor, review, and manage implementation. These changes and challenges within the global architecture have prompted society collectively to prepare a new sustainable development index based on a new set of indicators of the broader challenges threatening the world's sustainable development path, poverty eradication should remain as an overarching goal of the sustainable development goal. The primary objective of the sustainable development, development goal is to revisit this vision while reaffirming the past political commitments. Ensuring tangible actions to take place towards sustainable development. Thus, the sustainable approach has become a major requirement in all our research studies, in implementation of results, and in application in real life. And in this, we have the sustainability science, which foundations was built on the natural and social sciences, on engineering and medicine, and on the multiple knowledge of practice. Its methods are integrative and translational, seeking to link knowledge with action. Sustainability science seeks to integrate many sources of knowledge, the research of scientists and, technolo and technologists, the work of practitioners as well with them, and the experience of users of knowledge. Increasingly, research transcends the major disciplines 
as interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary efforts. In interdisciplinary research, scientists collaborate by asking how their disciplinary skills and understanding can contribute to the research. Whereas in multidisciplinary research, they collectively undertake the research. In the transdisciplinary research of sustainability science, they frame the research questions together in ways that transcend their disciplinary origins and require new integrative understanding. Valuable knowledge is also resident in the skills and tacit understanding of practitioners, be they from the many professions of agriculture, engineering, and health, or resident in the traditional knowledge of farmers, builders, and healers. We have here the three dimensions of sustainability. Where do we stand? Today, the field has developed a core research agenda, an increasing flow of results, and the growing number of universities committed to teaching its methods and findings. A series of regional workshops have been organized by the International Initiative on Science Technology for Sustainability, the Academy of Science and the Developing World, and the International Council for Science for the purpose of articulating local priorities for research needed to support sustainable development. Our move towards a better future could be through knowledge transfers and seeking solution local and global. Knowledge transfers, moving knowledge into action, requires a transfer of such knowledge from the knowledge producer to the users or practitioners of that knowledge. Three basic models of knowledge transfers, science curiosity driven, translational, interactive. In the first, science is curiosity driven. The best of basic science may or may not have practical use, but will eventually trickle down into practice. In the second, it is translational. It assumes that much scientific knowledge is useful, but it needs to be translated into language and applications that practitioners can use. For instance, if we have a report of sociology, and that uh, the, an urban planner and architects with him are going to work, they don't need to read all the report, but they need to have a way of communication that helps them understand thoroughly what is required from the uh, sociological research. The third model is interactive. Knowledge and utility transfers move back and forth leading at their best to the co-production for sustainability of knowledge and action. And this, I would say, the, could be in the transdisciplinary act that people pose the questions together, they start working together, and that all parties are involved, the professionals, the users, the uh, decision makers, the researchers. Every part is together, work together. Seeking solution global and local, these are excerpts uh, that I quoted from Robert Cates uh, in his book on readings in sustainability science, which is on the net. Uh, and he uh, is uh, suggesting that some readings in each of these uh, points, for instance, on stabi stabilized population numbers, we, li we read Bongard in, and others. Improve health, we need Gates Foundation. Provide water and sanitation, we read Gleck, Funke Al, and others. Intensify agriculture and food security, Conway and others. Modify consumption, create sustainable cities, maintain biodiversity, 
preserve ecosystem service, clean air and water, restore marine resources, increase resilience to disaster, integrate the user as an active participant in any decision-making process. And as the Ara Khan put it, he said development is sustainable only if the beneficiaries become, in a gradual manner, the masters of the process. And finally, I would add, to look globally at issues with the aim of achieving harmony, harmony with nature, harmony with the built environment, and give a special attention to human health and to human solidarity. To unite instead of divide, to help establishing a more united world community where members help each other at all levels and where solidarity is its equipment to face future and natural threats. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to present one of the papers uh, today and uh, after a talk from the Emeritus Professor Alia Abdelhadi, which is very deep, mine is more towards the practical aspect of that. And uh, as mentioned earlier, my, my paper is on urban sprawl, on city com competitiveness, and I'm trying to relate it more towards the Social economy, which is my area of research, uh, some on cultural, but mostly within the context of Asia. And uh, last time I was in Bangkok was in '98 at the height of the ASEAN Asian economic crisis. So it's nice to be back now and see that Bangkok is doing well economically, and everything seems. Uh, Beautiful, active, and sprawling. <laughs> <laughs> so the the paper here that I'm doing is more on the on globalization, like what Professor Alia presented just now. But I'm also looking at the city competitiveness and then the related open sprawl, and then. What's the implication in terms of the socio-economic and cultural life? And this is in the context of Malaysian cities, but I think it can be applied as well to other cities in Southeast Asia. And it's quite, it's quite interesting when I read in the nation newspaper this morning and yesterday about how certain foreign ministers, uh, there's an ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in Phnom Penh, and for the first time, 45 years history of ASEAN, they failed to issue a joint community, uh, which is like usually in ASEAN context they always have it. But somehow this this year Cambodia is the chairman of that meeting, and then uh, the joint community didn't come out at the end, and then start to see, and then it's quite interesting article uh, today in the nation like who's like behind this. And it's quite interesting in that sense so it's, uh, because like, this is related to the issue of spread list. And then so even though you see the ASEAN solidarity, then you will also see have some ASEAN competition. Okay? And uh, well that's what I said as a block against China, but also among Asian ASEAN nations, there are also like certain areas where they overlap claims. Okay, I think Malaysia and Philippines and uh, maybe we Vietnam as well. So this is also the same as the city competitors, there's also competition among ASEAN cities. And so this is what the paper is about, and it's quite interesting where 
there is like the implication to the social economies, especially looking at the social economy, because now the city is not just a place to live. The city is the key to economic growth. And it has the implication on social economy and it has implication on competitiveness. So, and uh, as I mentioned, it's, I read more to Malaysian cities because, I mean, I'm sure many of you uh, the experts on Bangkok or other cities, so uh, perhaps you can do some comparison based on this one. And I'm going to start more on the early economic planning in Malaysia, uh, because like in Malaysia in the 1960s through the mid 80s, it was focused more on what they call as regional development. And regional development here means that more on you open up new areas focus on want to reduce regional disparities among regions. So you go to places where the poor are, the areas are rural in nature. And regional authorities were open up in various places, especially in the peninsula. And then new towns uh, were opened up in the frontier regions. And there was like a various economic theories through that time, regional planning. Uh, that saying that, okay, this is like the pull factor to get people into the frontier areas. And this is, uh, the states I listed there are those like what they call as uh, least developed states in the peninsula of Malaysia. And which, this one, okay, yeah. so those are the areas that were regional development authorities uh, were given emphasis most uh, in Qatar, close to uh, tight water. Okay, during World War II, uh, these two states here, four states were under Thailand at that time. And then this is Qasadar uh, there, that kind of in Kelantan and Terengganu, and this is Terengganu, and Pahang, and Kejora here, Southeast Kepo. So these are the least developed states in Malaysia, especially during that time in the 1960s. And then, uh, so they were, Mostly created like Dara Kejora in the early 70s and so all of this were in the 70s. Okay. So that was really the time the focus was uh, some of you like up here this is uh, Penang Island, okay. one of the three major metropolitan areas. This is Kuala Lumpur, the capital, and down here is Johor Bahru. So these are the three main cities of Malaysia along the west coast and Johor Bahru next to Singapore. And the purpose was on the okay, that development. The theory was basically bring development to the least uh, developed state, so that we are able to bring more development to the people who are there, provide employment and bring investment. And it should be noted, but this one was also done in conjunction with the new economic policy. And I think. Uh, Almost all of you know about Malaysian new economic policy where the two main object, objectives were to reduce poverty and also to restructure the society Socio, uh, economically. That in a way wanted the Malays who, are cons who is the majority of the population, their income, the share of the national wealth to increase from 2% in 1970 to 30% by 1990. And for the other ethnic groups in Malaysia, for the uh, share of the economy to be 40%. And then the rest are by foreign multinationals. I think by the end of the NAP 1990, the share of the Malays that increased to 20, 23%. And now about 23%. So one of the strategies of doing that is by moving development to these areas, which are, this is the area of the, where the Malays are. So in a way that you are able to achieve the objective of a new economic policy uh, of giving the wealth to the Malays. And after that, new area up here in the 80s, uh, Keda and Perda near Pitang, and then Jika in the 80s. So all the 50s, the 70s and 80s, and then those are the financial allocation which quite a lot of Malaysia got uh, funds from the World Bank to implement this. Okay. And basically, the impacts were basically positive. 
it became a model for other developing countries and many countries like flocked to Malaysia during that time to see how did we do it. Uh, because in a way that now with the product uh, product global venture, it's more impacts on that. So the landless, because what happened during that time, the landless they live in uh, riverine areas and they didn't have land. So when they open up new land, they are given the land and the government pro provided loan to them. They got income for ten years and then over the years. They are able to pay gradually and they own the 10 acre of land for the family. And now with urbanization, the price of land has increased tremendously and then they <coughs> some of them became a, a new millionaires. However, the new towns in the frontier regions were not very successful. It did not manage to attack big population. There's a lot of studies have been done this in Malaysia by Ganis Aleph from USM and uh, Abraham Ngah from UTM on regional development and the impacts of this. Because I think most of these towns, because they're away from uh, the main city centers, some uh, like Bandar Mutafi Bila Shah, Bandar Muazzam Shah, Bandar Jengkel, I think some only managed to attract one third of the expected population. But in terms of the social economy, it was successful, it is in terms of urbanization. And culturally, it's still rural in nature. But this one is a lot of study done on this, and I'm not going to spend de much detail on this. What I'm going to spend about is more on what happened after that, which is the recession of the 1980s, when uh, Tun Mahathir, the Prime Minister at that time, said that, okay, forget about agriculture. Yes, we are at the whims of the developed nations, because at that time, the recession of the mid-80s were brought about by drop a rapid drop of prices of commodities, especially tin and palm oil. Okay. So, Mahade opened up Malaysia to foreign investment and Japanese firms came in row. And this being export-oriented activities, they tend to locate in the, uh, in the fringe of uh, big cities on the west coast. KL, Penang and Jumbo Baru. Okay, this process I show this now. And that's also an impact on the uh, social economy and culture as well and there was a phenomenon at that time we get the word uh, Minakaran and Karan is like kind of uh, saying that electricity but in a way that Minah is a uh, girl so these are basically rural uh, young rural Malay girls who migrated to the city to work in the electronic factories okay so we have the term of Minakaran in the 80s of course we don't hear that much now that term so when I say young ones and they say you know what that means Okay, because they are playing with their iPad and iPhones. Okay. Uh, so, what it did was that since manufacturing, because of uh, the theory of elasticity of demand, they are much more elastic. So, the income of the population increased uh, faster compared to the regional development before. And now, uh, during the regional development in agriculture, basically the head of household was probably the only one who can uh, earn money, the rest is helping out. But with electronic industry, those who work, even the young girls as young as 18 or 19 can earn income to support the family. So we have the, there's a greater impact on social economy, higher income for the family, and make Malaysia a middle income nation. Of course, during this time, the same thing happened in Thailand as well. I think uh, after the Accord Plaza, uh, where the, uh, I think Japanese yen appreciate tremendously, and a lot of Japanese folks uh, move out uh, to Southeast Asia. And at that time, the two countries that really uh, opened up for investments were Malaysia and Thailand. Of course, Singapore started earlier, and Vietnam and China didn't open up until later. So there's the rise of manufacturing and rapid urban growth. And As an impact on that, Malaysia officially became an urban nation in 1991 when the census of that year showed that 54.4% of Malaysia live in urban areas and Malaysia has not looked back. Now, uh, it's more than 65%, will be 20% by 2020. But what happened is that the urban growth and development, they are actually what they call in suburban areas. And that's what I'm going to show to you after this. What happens is that there is a shift from the rural area back to the city area, but 
the city area are the main metropolitan areas and these are not in the inner city they tend to be in the suburban towns and this has implication on social economy as well as uh, cultural and this is what called as the problem of urban sprawl which is kind of this is a uh, kind of new research that's been done a lot in many countries throughout the world and then the sprawl, uh, the research that I did, I covered most on the three major metropolitan areas of Malaysia. And of course, now we have started to go into the secondary city, which include uh, Kuantan, Ipoh, and Malacca. But what is that the sprawl in metropolitan show the rapid of suburban uh, growth. And then in some of the city, like Georgetown in Penang, there's a population decline. Okay, there are census of 91, 2000, 2020, then one, uh, just one actually lost population. I mean, that means there's out migration of people. Or in other cities like KL and Johor Bahru, it increased slowly. Okay, much slower compared to the suburban areas. And probably um, uh, those who are familiar with this, uh, they'll be able to see from the data they have here. So that's for KL, that's where the city is, and you start to see it sprawling throughout. Uh, especially to the west and to the south and I think yesterday I took the the BRT like all the way uh, to Mongkit and then to the other end and you start to see like it's really sprawling there's so many centers uh, in Bangkok for that and then that's Johor Bahru uh, Causeway to Singapore and then the other one where you show is Penang Metropolitan so these are the three largest metropolitan region in Malaysia and then, here, uh, what you see here is that the latest census, 2010, that just came out a few months ago. And population of within the federal territory of Kuala Lumpur about 1.5 million. But you start to see is that Klang is towards the coast. It's like 40 kilometers away. And Klang population is almost 1 million. And then, Subang Jaya is halfway between Klang and KL. Also, about half the size of Kuala Lumpur. And then the rest of other urban areas like Kajang is almost a million as well. And these are the things that people... Uh